As South Africa continues to find solutions to the country's energy crisis, avenues of cooperation with BRICS partners are opening greater doors for innovation and development. The Department of Women, Youth and People with Disabilities, in partnership with the Federation of India's Chamber of Commerce and Industry, have facilitated a program that will see 22 young South African women take part in the solar technology training program that's going to be held in India. It's called the Solar Mamas Program. We'll find out more with Minister Dr. Nkosazana Dlamini Zuma, and we'll also discuss what the department is doing when it comes to the ongoing GBV crisis. Minister, good morning, and thank you very much for joining us on the program. Thank you for your time. What will um, success look like for this program, coming out of this program? Will the 22 young women come back certified, ready to get to work and possibly even training others? Well, first let me explain that we, we, we're working with the <laughs> Indians, but we involved the energy and water CETA uh, so that when they come back, they, 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 we are able to work with them. So the energy and water sector actually is the one that funded their transport to India and their tuition fee. So we're working together with the sector already. So when they come back, we are hoping that they will be able to do some practical work here in South Africa. And we are also working with CSIR, a CSIR engineer will go to India uh, during the course just to check what the training is like so that when they come back, we can be ready for them. And we hope that in the medium term, some of them may start their own companies. We are also working with uh, the Department of Trade Industry and uh, competition because they have a fund for black industrialists. So we're also in, involving them so that we can see when they come back, depending on what they want to do themselves, because we're not going to force them mm. one way or the other. They must take their, make their own choice. So if they want to start their own companies, we'll work with the DTIC and see if they can, those who want to do that. But uh, we are also talking with other companies who want to roll out uh, solar so that when um, they come back, maybe they'll be also get practice from those, company, the, those companies that want to roll out solar in their buildings and yeah. so on. How so, many other learnership yeah. programs, Minister, does your department engage in to cover, you've got quite a vast um, portfolio, all of the categories, young people, children, persons with disabilities. Um, just share with us a little bit more. This is one program that you've engaged in with partners. Give us a, a, you know, a topographical view of how many other programs your, your, your department is involved in. Okay, uh, we don't deal with children. Children are with uh, the Department of Social Development. Uh, as you know, the, the NYTA falls, works with us. So most of the programs of young people are done by, through the NYTA. And they train youth under 35 in jobs. They also assist them with startups uh, for their businesses. But as a department, we don't get any funding for doing anything other than advocating. So that's what we are funded for by government, to advocate. But we have taken the initiative that, well, where we can talk to other people and have some programs, we will do that. Uh, for instance, we are working on a bakery program. We spoke to uh, a foundation in Mkuse, uh, and the, the foundation started the bakery program for uh, for young people and women, both young men and men, young women and men, and we are also working on other areas. 
uh, soon we will be calling you to come and see uh, us. Uh, we, we got a donation, for instance, from, from China uh, for juicing machines. So we are going to be distributing those juicing machines yeah. to people who will use them to have small um, business to to juice and and sell and sell yeah. and we'll be trying to get a market for them. Even on that, we are working also with uh, the Department of Trade and Industry. So we we really work with people with donations, but we have no funding ourselves for doing anything other than advocating. Given that that is the case... We are um, also working with the Defence Force. So I want to come in on that point, uh, Dr. Dlamini uh, Zuma, just on the advocacy that, in, in a sense, you are restricted to do your work in a particular way. And thank you very much for sharing just uh, some of the other ideas that your department is engaged in, in terms of creating economic opportunities for those that you represent in the department. But when we think about, and I want to move it to the conversation around the GBV crisis experienced in South Africa today. Today, 70 people will be killed, over 100 Others will be raped or sexually assaulted. Those that actually end up accounting for their crimes and being punished are at a very low level, around 8.6% with a guilty verdict for a sexual offence. And these are only the cases that are reported, investigated, and then go to court. You'll be aware that attrition is high. In other words, police can have, you know, they can make the decision about whether they believe a survivor and want to investigate. At the court level, the state prosecutor can decline to prosecute due to insufficient evidence and so many other instances where this will not see the light of day. As you talk to our viewers and to those you represent, what can you share with them about the work you have done to change the experience of the vulnerable in our country and protect them and prevent GBV? Well, for a start, I think we must put this record straight that the prevention of GBV falls in all our hands. It's a, a, an all of society problem. It can't be a departmental issue because GBV happens in families, it happens in communities, it happens at work, it happens everywhere. So all of us must take responsibility to preventing GPV in our space. Earlier you were talking, I was listening to you, how we raise, well, how we should raise our children, boys especially. So in, in rural areas, the traditional leaders should take part in, in saying in this area, we will not tolerate GPV. In municipal, everywhere, everyone must participate. But in our case, we also have the, the strategic plan that every department has to implement. As I say, it's an all of government and an all of society approach. We've just uh, passed a bill to form a council that will oversee uh, the implementation of the strategic plan. We also uh, do the 16 days of activism, but we have said now, yes, we'll do the, two, the 16 days, but the prevention of GPV should be every day. We can't just pay attention to GPV on the six, during the 16 days. We should pay attention to it right through the year. And, 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 so, and there's a lot of agreement, even, Minister. Even yourselves, mm. even yourselves, have a big responsibility in preventing GPV in your space, but also in talking to uh, society because you, you have a, a wider reach to, to people. Minister, so I think you we, would find... Yeah, you would find a lot of agreement for what you said, that this is an all of society problem. We've had researchers and activists all say exactly the same thing. But 
in the individual responsibility that all of us bear, this is where the question is coming from, for your department specifically, what work can you share with the public of what you have done to ensure that you have deployed whatever resources you have, whatever reach you have, the position that the, ministry, the department occupies in South Africa to deal with the issue of GBV? I want to go further. We have all these weapons to fight GBV. We've got the laws. We've got the national policy um, framework for women's empowerment and gender equality. We've got the national strategic plan on gender-based violence and femicide. We've got the gender-based violence command center. We've got a 24-7 helpline for victims of GBV. And still, women and children are not safe in their homes and in society. Is it possible that the, the department, and perhaps you have, maybe if, if you have and we, we're not aware, we can, you can remind us, to declare GBV a pandemic? And what would that mean? Well, yes, we, we, have, we, we, we have said to cabinet, it's not enough for the president to say GPV is a second pandemic. We should put steps that show that it is a second pandemic. And well, the, the, part of the, the council that is being formed is to also assist in that, but we have also said that the, the president soon will be signing a pledge. We, 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 we have developed a pledge that every man, and a pledge for women as well, that will be signed first by the president as their first citizen, and we will be encouraging all men to sign that pledge. But also there are examples of excellence. There is a school, for instance, a boys' school in Johannesburg, St. Benedict. All the boys there, when they come to that school, they have to sign a pledge about how they treat women, both as, as scholars, but also as they grow up to be men. We are also talking with uh, other departments, including COPTA, to say that we need uh, the municipalities to be involved. We need the provinces to be involved in ensuring that they do programs to prevent GBV, but also to report. But we also work with um, the, the, the Department of Infrastructure and Public Works to ensure that they give us buildings which social development use for shelters for women and children who need to move from uh, environments that yeah. are abusive. We, we, we also working with traditional leaders, as I said, to say in, in my area, there shouldn't be a GPV. And we, we also want to link it with, we, we also working with Department of Education because teenage pregnancy, especially uh, teenagers that are underage, yeah. it is a crime to have sex with an underage girl. But sometimes parents are the ones who don't want it reported. We, we are also working to educate society that you, you, you shouldn't turn a blind eye when an older man is having an affair with a 15-year-old, a 13-year-old. It's a crime in South Africa. But a lot of families tend to shield. Um, and some of the men, because of poverty, they then give the family something so that the family does not report. Yeah. So the, the, the is, it's a multidimensional problem that we, have to, we, we are trying to approach from every angle. Dr. Nkosezana Dlamini Zuma, yes, you know, when you talk about this is, again, an issue where communities have to also take action and they have to bear responsibility for making sure that action is taken, that the police do their job. I, I want to ask about whether it's time for this to be declared a pandemic, 
for the minister, for the department such as yourself, in a similar way as you have a war room for electricity, which is a massive issue in South Africa, a war room around GBV, weekly briefings around actions uh, that not only your department, but other departments, some of those which you have already mentioned, are taking so that it seems as if it's an all hands on deck situation. Yes. When we think of the economic losses, there's a study, a conservative estimate by KPMG, that it costs our country almost 29 to 30 billion billion rand in dealing with GBV and this cost is mostly borne by those families the women who have to take off work because they're too beaten up to go to the office the children who need therapy because they they they're, they're traumatized or the children themselves who are the victims of uh, sexual offenses or sexual violence it seems as if it needs a lot more energy and a lot more seriousness than what we have currently experienced in South Africa how would you respond to that Yes, I completely agree. That's why I said to you initially, we've taken this matter to cabinet to say GPV should be declared uh, as a pandemic. The president has said it, but the, 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 the government program does not follow what he has said. And we even said it should be treated as in the way we treated COVID. Because there, there would be things that need to be done. Of course, some of the things that were done with COVID are not necessary, but it would be necessary, for instance, as you say, for every week to have the statistics, to make sure that the police are chasing whoever, to make sure that there are programs, just like there were programs to try and prevent people getting COVID, to have those kind of programs from the whole of government, the, all the three spheres of government yeah. to be involved in that. We, we've, we've said that to cabinet. So it's we, we can't do it and just declare it ourselves. It will have to be a cabinet decision and then every program must then follow that. Do you wish so you were we, the president, Dr. Dlamini Zuma, to to do these sorts of things, as you say, you, you, know, you hand the baton over, nothing really happens after that. Do you wish you were in the driver's seat? <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that to you because you know my history. So, uh, yes, if, 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 I, if I had the power to do it, I would have done it already. But, of course, as I say, it needs to be a decision that's taken by cabinet. Is this really but the we've taken the, matter, we've taken the matter to cabinet ourselves. And a final one, I mean, you know, you've resigned from parliament, you won't be coming back. Is this really the end of your political career? Um, it's the end of my parliamentary career, not life. Uh, I'm not retiring from life. I'm not retiring from politics but I'm retiring from parliament, from being a member of parliament. I'll still be a member of the NEC, of the ANC. I'll still do whatever I, I want to do in society, but I, I'm retiring from being a member of parliament. Will we see you in a new party or in another leadership race in the ANC? Why should I go to a new party? What kind of question is that? No, I'm saying a lot of, um, um, it's only coming in the um, context, Dr. Lamini Zuma, of other political players who've been longtime members of the ANC forging a different political path for themselves. That's the, that's where the that's question fine. is coming I've from. I've said I'm retiring from parliament. So why would I now go to another part? I'm retiring from parliamentary politics. All right. Dr. Nkosazana Lamini Zuma, thanks for talking to us this morning. We appreciate your time. Minister in the Department of Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities.